All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Fossil Roadshow webinar, Fossils of the Carolinas. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sadie Mills, your moderator for tonight. As always, our webinars are being offered as a partnership with the Paleontological Society and for facilitated by iDigBio's Adobe Connect platform. This webinar is part of our Fossil Roadshow series, where we've been visiting fossil clubs around the country to learn about club members' favorite finds. The first stop in this series featured trilobite specimens shared by the dry dredgers of Cincinnati and included expert identification tips from Dr. Brenda Hunda of the Cincinnati Museum. The second episode took place in Dallas, where the Dallas Paleontological Society and Dr. Merlin Nestel of UT Arlington shared Pennsylvania fossils of North Texas. Recordings of both these episodes are available on myfossil.org. Tonight, we are so excited to continue the roadshow in Greenville, North Carolina, where members of the Special Friends of the Aurora Fossil Museum will be sharing specimens from the fabulous fossil room of club member George Powell, Jr. Now, before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping. This webinar should end no later than 8 p.m. Eastern Time. No one except for the presenters and myself have active microphones, so as long as you can hear us, see the PowerPoint, and see our presenters in the webcams, you're good to go. Please know, though, that you can type in the chat box at any time. We'll record your questions as you ask them, and then we'll pause throughout the program to ask these questions to our presenters. If you're having trouble with technology at any point, try exiting the program and re-entering Adobe Connect. Or if you need technical support, type in the chat box and our team will help you out. Also, please don't forget to take the short survey after the webinar ends. It is really important to us for reporting purposes to our funding agency, the National Science Foundation, so we truly appreciate your time in taking the survey. This webinar is being recorded, and we will make the recording available under the resources section on myfossil.org. Finally, if you've participated in all four webinars of this series and would like to receive a Series 3 attendance certificate, please email fossil at flnnh.ufl.edu to request one after the program. And now for some quick introductions. Our featured club tonight is the Special Friends of the Aurora Fossil Museum. This society supports the educational programs and provides for the capital needs of the Aurora Fossil Museum through fundraising, volunteer labor, and technical assistance. We have with us tonight club president, Lee Cohn, who has been instrumental in helping put this webinar together. We also welcome special friend members, Don Moeller and Linda McCall. Finally, we are especially thankful to George Powell, Jr., who is hosting tonight's webinar in his amazing fossil room, which contains more than 15,000 specimens. We'd also like to thank Ash Hendrick for providing technical support in the fossil room. We're also thrilled tonight to have Dr. Bobby Bassnechner, who is an adjunct of Charleston Mace Brown Museum of Natural History. His current research focuses on fossil cetaceans in South Carolina, and we are really excited to have his marine mammal expertise with us tonight. So with that, we thank you all so much for attending tonight's webinar, and of course a big thank you to our speakers for sharing their time, knowledge, and specimens with us. Here's a quick overview of our program tonight. We will begin with some marine mammal specimens, and then take a look at some shark teeth. We'll next learn about a few invertebrate specimens and then conclude with additional teeth fossils. After each of these sections, we will pause to allow time for audience questions. After answering as many questions as we can, we'll wrap things up with a conclusion. So we're going to go ahead and get things started with some marine mammal specimens. Our first specimen comes from Don Muller. Don, why don't you tell us a little bit about these fossils? Yeah, how you doing? Um, these two specimens are found at uh, Lee Creek, a PTS phosphate mine in Aurora, North Carolina. Uh, I think that they are whale flipper, uh, more like finger pieces, uh, phalanges they might be called. I'm not entirely certain about that. They have slightly different shapes certainly different sizes, so I wouldn't know which part of it, the flipper they might be. Yeah. Or perhaps uh, Dr. Bosnacker can tell us about them. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, Bobby's microphone. Tell us about these fossils. <clears throat> so these are indeed um, what 
you'd colloquially refer to as finger bones. Um, they are quite large. The one on the left looks about seven to eight centimeters long, roughly. Um, yeah, about seven. So that is far, far too large for a dolphin. Um, so that would pr probably be from a baleen whale if it is from the Pliocene Yorktown Formation, which was exposed at the Lee Creek Mine. Um, both of them are large enough to be from a baleen whale. There is a sperm whale from the assemblage that might be quite large, but um, regardless, uh, these likely represent either a metacarpal or a uh, phalanx. Um, and of course, whales uh, from the last 20 million years don't have any hind legs, so uh, these are almost certainly from forelimbs. Uh, one critical anatomical feature present is, and it's difficult to see in this view, but if you look, each end is, a, is flat um, and appears to be kind of rough. And that is an, that is a, a caused by the loss of having a synovial joint, i.e. a joint you can uh, pop or crack like we can. Um, instead, uh, as part of stiffening the flipper, baleen whales and echolocating dolphins have fibrocartilaginous uh, fibro pads in between their finger bones um, in order to stiffen uh, and form a, a nice paddle-like flipper that doesn't, um, it's not very flexible. So in order to make a good hydrofoil, um, the phalanges have these flat articulations capped with fiber cartilage. Great. Thank you, Bobby, for that extra information. We're going to next take a look at some other fossils um, from Don. Uh, Don, what can you tell us about these? And I'm going to ask um, that you speak up a little bit, please. OK. Thanks, Bobby, for that excellent information on the, uh, the flipper parts. Uh, following on with what I think is whale material, these appear to be uh, whale fullers, I believe you pronounce it, ear, ear parts, uh, found at PCS as well. Uh, I'm not sure why the center one is black. It might be from a, it might have been an old river that went through the, the mine. Uh, the others are more like the, the colors you'd expect to see in mineralization at uh, PCS. So maybe you can identify species or anything else about them. Uh, yeah, thank you, Don. Uh, Bobby, go ahead. Tell us what you know. So all three of these are also from baleen whales. And all three of these are um, probably from the Yorktown formation uh, based upon their overall anatomy. There are very, very few middle Miocene baleen whales from the underlying Pungo River limestone, which is the older of the two units at the Lee Creek Mine. The middle one is black because it is phosphatized. And a lot of the fossils at the base of the Yorktown formation are found in a bone bed. And there's a lot of phosphatized material. And it's just um, the blacker something becomes, the more enriched in calcium phosphate it is. This specimen in the middle appears to be from uh, a probably a right whale, not too dissimilar from um, North Atlantic right whale, uh, Eubalina. Uh, there's fossils of Eubalina and as well as early bowhead whales, Balina ricei, from the Yorktown Formation in Virginia. Um, I can't tell about the other two. The other two are probably Balanopterid whales. Balanopterids are like humpback, minke, blue, fin whales. Um, if they were in a different view, I'd probably be able to tell more. Um, Balanopterids, like the other two, uh, the left and right bullae, um, those, those represent the most common baleen whales from the Lee Creek Mine. This element is called the tympanic bulla, and it is one of the two major ear bones. Um, and both ear bones, the, the tympanic bulla and the petrosal, which houses the cochlea, um, the actual spiral organ of hearing, um, are somewhat separated from the skull, and the tympanic bulla is extremely dense and basically serves, I call it an acoustic pendulum. Um, we don't really know a whole lot about how modern baleen whales hear, uh, with the exception that we know their entire skull rattles, um, and it's thought that the entire length of the skull is involved in hearing now. 
those vibrations are channeled down into the tympanic bulla, which then transfers the vibrations into the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, the middle ear ossicles, and then into the inner ear itself. Um, baleen whales have these massive uh, and very distinctive ear bones. Uh, and as Don mentioned, they are uh, highly uh, diagnostic. Um, you can often identify uh, baleen whales to the family, if not genus level, and sometimes even to the species level based upon the shape and size of the tympanic bulla, um, which is slightly less informative than the um, petrosal, the inner ear bone, um, but still a very useful specimen or a very useful type of fossil. So Bobby, would they both be from the Great. Uh, unit two of the Yorktown? Would uh, they be from again, George... unit two of the Yorktown? Um, I think they're found in unit I think they're found in pretty much all of the units of the Yorktown. The black phosphatized one I would imagine to be from okay. unit one, which if memory serves as the base, the basal bone bed. Um, uh, I'd love to go into the mine myself and figure that out with enough uh, uh, field exploration, but it might be a while. Great, thank you. Up next, we have um, a couple of amazing specimens from Lee. So Lee, take it away. Okay, Tell us you. about these. Um, these are two teeth that I found. The one on the left is an RKC. That tooth came from Harleyville, South Carolina. And the one on the right is a tooth that came out of the Aurora mine uh, in Aurora, uh, the PCS mine. Interesting story about the archaeocete tooth. It was found in formation. Um, the, the mine had cleaned off all the overburden down to the green cap, and we were able to peel back the green cap. And as I peeled back the green cap, this tooth lay on the limestone bed of the uh, 35 million year old. Uh, uh, ocean floor back then, and there was also a, uh, an auriculata tooth that was right beside it, a much smaller one. But And the uh, tooth on the right, um, very unique story with that. George Powell and I were sitting uh, eating our lunch uh, in the Aurora mine, um, and George was talking and telling me a story, and uh, I, I looked out and something caught my eye on the ground in front of me, probably 15 or 20 feet away. And I, I just, for whatever reason, got up, walked over there, and picked that up. And I know that is a very rare tooth. Uh, I sent it to the Smithsonian and Dave Bahaska. Uh, at that time was unable to identify it, um, but the tooth now resides in the Mace Brown Museum. Whoops. We just lost the picture. Oh, there it is. Okay, it resides in the Mace Brown Museum uh, down in Charleston. So uh, my question, I'd like to get a little bit more information about the tooth on the right. Uh, if Bobby is able to uh, talk about that. And the one on the left, I would like to know the species of that, if, uh, of that archaeocete too. So back to you, Sadie. Well, thank you, Lee. That's, uh, those are some amazing finds. Um, Bobby, if you want to tell us what you know about these, that would be great. All right. So, um, the one on the left is a little easier to talk about, so I'll sum that up as quickly as I can. Um, the one on the left, uh, uh, from the, the famous green cap, which is, I believe, the Harleyville Formation, which is latest Eocene. Um, now, if you look, it's a rather large tooth um, for its position. Uh, it's a, just over 10 centimeters long. Um, that is a lower molar of a basilosaurid archaeocete. So things like Dorodon, 
Cynthia Cetus, Basilosaurus. These are all um, uh, North Atlantic basilosaurid whales. They are the earliest, I guess you could call them legless whales. They are, uh, they still have hind legs, but they're not functional for locomotion. Um, some of these got quite large. Basilosaurus detoides uh, approached a 20 meter body length with uh, about a meter and a half, two meter long, uh, yeah, about a meter and a half long skull. Um, and archaeocetes, like basilosaurids, have differentiated teeth. Teeth of different shapes and different positions of the jaw. Very, uh, very different from what you would see in a modern bottlenose dolphin, where all the teeth are little pegs about the same size and shape along the length of the jaw. Uh, basilosaurid molars, the lower molars in particular, have accessory cusps only on the posterior side i.e. the side closest to the back of the jaw, and then a single long blade on the anterior side. So the uh, tooth on the left, the direction to the left is towards the front of the jaw, and to the right is to the back of the jaw. And having that l lack of cusps on the front side, the anterior side, um, identifies this as a lower molar. As for the species, if large size basically makes this um, one of only two options, Cynthia Cetus maxwelli or Basilosaurus cetoides. And we know we have both Basilosaurus and Cynthia Cetus present in the Harleyville Formation uh, thanks to other, other ear bones and skulls present in the Mace Brown Museum collection. So it could be from either. Um, some closer comparisons are probably necessary, but I'm confident it belongs to either one of those. All the other archaeocetes from South Carolina are much, much smaller, and the lower molar would be about half the size. Now, the tooth on the right is a very fascinating and also an extremely frustrating tooth. Um, and I've recently submitted a paper on this specimen, which Lee very generously donated to the Mace Brown Museum, where it is now on display. Up until about three or four months ago, I thought that this tooth was from a toothed baleen whale, a toothed mystici. And we have toothed baleen whales from the Oligocene of South Carolina. This specimen is from the older of two formations uh, present in the Lee Creek Mine, the Pungo River Limestone, which um, the Pungo Formation uh, records about a 10 million year depositional history from the earliest Miocene to the mid-Miocene. 14 to 23 million years ago, or, or roughly. Uh, there is a similar tooth. Um, there, there's a couple other teeth of, from the mine representing the same animal. And the first record of this sort of whale or dolphin um, is Phococetus vasconum from the early Miocene of France. And Phococetus has a long uh, and confusing history. It has been variably interpreted to be a late surviving archaeocete or a toothed baleen whale. The other possibility, about three or four months ago, um, a new type of uh, very bizarre dolphin called Intecetus was reported from the early Miocene of Peru, um, the earliest Miocene, about 20 to 23 million years old, which is roughly uh, coeval with the base of the Pungo River formation. Intecetus has teeth that look just like this, um, which is very, very weird because it is much more archaeocete. The teeth look much more like a toothed baleen whale or an archaeocete, but they are in the skull of what looks basically like a squalodon. It's not a squalodon because it's got very different features, but it is very, very clearly an echolocating odontocete that has teeth like this. So uh, it's not an archaeocete because it's too young. However, um, it's sort of a toss-up the, for the time being whether or not this represents an Intecetus-like whale or uh, something much more like the toothed baleen whale Coronadon um, from the Oligocene of South Carolina. So. Uh, I'm going to have to rewrite a lot of my paper because of that new dolphin from South America. Um, 
and likely my paper will get rejected because of that. <laughs> so it's, a, it's like I said, it's a very interesting tooth uh, uh, that has generated a lot of um, heated argument with, between myself and some of my colleagues. Well, thank you, Bobby. That is some great information about two very fascinating teeth. Um, we're going to keep our marine mammal specimens going with another one brought to us by Lee. Lee, go ahead and tell us about this bone. It, this is a whale rib uh, that I found in Somerville. Uh, it's quite large piece of whale rib. Um, but I think the thing that makes this so special is the shark tooth bite marks that are on this. It's not uncommon to find bones uh, that have small predation marks, bite marks, uh, on them. But to find one with a massive bite marks like this one uh, seems to have. And actually, if you look closely, you won't be able to see it uh, on the computer. But um, if you actually look closely, you can see the serrations of a meg tooth that would have ripped this open um, in, in one of the walls uh, of, of one of the cuts. It, it's an amazing uh, fossil. All right, thank you, Lee. Um, Bobby, what can you tell us about this specimen? So it's um, unclear. Um, well, it looks like a, like a rib fragment, um, and a lot of these pieces like this turn up in creeks in Somerville, um, and a lot of them, I suspect, are reworked from um, older rockiness like the Goose Creek limestone, which is a lateral equivalent of the Yorktown exposed uh, at the Lee Creek Mine in North Carolina. Um, there's I would say often you will find evidence of shark bites like this. Um, however, it's never clear what percentage of fossil bone, whale bones have bite marks. Um, during my master's thesis, I recorded presence or absence of bite marks from uh, a Miocene Pliocene unit on the west coast, of the Perissima Formation near Santa Cruz, and I found that maybe less than 5% of all whale bones had bite marks on them. Um, so for places like uh, Somerville or the Lee Creek Mine, where, there, where lots and lots of people have found um, specimens with gouges in them like this, um, it's unclear how many pieces they left by the wayside that didn't have them. Um, that being said, this is a pretty great specimen. It shows a large number. I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine different gouges. And there's probably more that I can't see in the photograph, um, uh, all on one side of the rib. It's pretty great when you can find um, the individual cut marks from serrations. Uh, another possibility, if it's not Carcharicles megalodon that bit this. Another possibility might be Carcharodon carcarius, which also has uh, serrated teeth. Um, and there's actually a trace fossil named for those bite marks where you can find the wavy serration cutting, and it's called, I think, serrasicness, um, like serration trace fossil is what it literally translates to. Uh, whatever the shark was doing, obviously uh, it seems that the edge of the rib was gouged a number of times. Um, I can't remember, I think the gouges, you don't find serration marks in them. I think the linear gouges are called linicness, which literally just means line-shaped trace, which is not, it's informative, but not very uh, fun sounding. Um, so there's a lot that can be done uh, with specimens like this, um, uh, if you look at big surveys of a large number of specimens, I think I think fossils like this are very interesting, and um, 
it'd be really interesting to know how common they are. Great, thank you, Bobby. Um, we've also got with us online in our chat box, University of Florida graduate student Victor Perez, and he actually studies fossil sharks. So we're going to take some time to answer some questions, but Victor, if you have any additional information about bite marks that you want to add, go ahead and type it in the chat box and we'll share with the audience. Now, one of our first questions that was submitted earlier, and this can be a question for anyone, um, someone wanted to know, how can you tell a fossil tooth from a modern tooth? It depends upon how you define the term fossil. Um, there's sort of a couple of different operating uh, definitions. One is anything that's been naturally buried. Another is anything that's been buried but is older than 10,000 years. Anything younger than 10,000 years would be a subfossil, which is arguably a um, uh, very subjective definition. The third would be based upon preservation if, if something has been permineralized. But plenty of fossils make it into the, plenty of bones make it into the fossil record without being permineralized. Uh, examples abound from places like the Lee Creek Mine where you pick up whale bones and it's basically just still a bone that hasn't been subjected to much diagenesis as far as uh, enriching the bone with uh, minerals. Phosphatic specimens are, um, or phosphatized specimens are an obvious exception. My own preference would be if anything has been buried, so if you find, if you dig the tooth out of the ground, even if it's only a few hundred years old, it's fossilized. But that's probably a controversial um, opinion. Well, thank you. Our next question is, um, do we know if the whales were living when attacked, or did the, scar uh, the shark scavenge from carcasses? That's a really good question. And even if you had a, a complete skeleton um, with gouge marks like this, it would be very, very difficult to tell. Um, one way to tell is, um, and there's a catch to it, one way to tell is if the bite marks show signs of healing. There are some examples, um, uh, there's like, I think there's actually a rib from the Lee Creek Mine, from the Yorktown Formation, that has a series of rehealed punctures in it that could either be from a megalodon or a giant predatory sperm whale. And each little puncture has been rehealed. So obviously that happened while the animal was alive. Um, in cases like this where there's no rehealing, it's possible that, you know, the animal died like a few days later, but not long enough for any healing to take place. So it's, it's possible that it was an attack, but it's not, not possible to to unequivocally say so. Um, if you find little tiny scratch marks from a shark that's obviously, or even a bony fish that's not very big, like, you know, little tiny scratch marks you'd make like with a fingernail, um, obviously a shark like that is not going to take down a baleen whale. And therefore, examples like that published by Dana Eret, um a few years ago uh, on specimens from Peru, uh, examples like that are obviously scavenging. But when it's a big tooth with no rehealing, it's possibly either. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, our last two questions are actually a little bit about nomenclature. So I'm going to skip back on the slides to ask them. Uh, the first question is, um, we had an audience member who wanted to know the name of the right tooth again, or your best guess for that. Uh, currently identified as phococetus, species indeterminate. Gotcha. Can you give us a spelling on that, please? P H O C P H O C O C E T U S, which literally means seal whale. Great, thank you. And Jeanette typed it into the chat box too to help make it a little easier uh, to read. And then our second question goes back to the whale ear part. Um, 
someone asked to repeat the taxa of the ones, to the best of your knowledge, to the ones on the left and on the right? So those are um, from Balanoptered whales, um, which is uh, B-A-L-A-E-N-O-P-T-E-R-I-D-A-E, -E -E, Balanopteridae. Um, and those are the literally the Rorquals. Rorqual is Norwegian for throat cleat. So these are the baleen whales that have the charismatic looking grooves running down the throat. Um, humpback, blue whales, fin whales, etc. Odds are these are something called Balanoptera borealina, which is um, a species known from Belgium and North Carolina uh, and South Carolina now um, that is horribly, horribly in need of revision and restudy. Um, the one in the middle is Eubalina, which is a right whale, um, or possibly a bowhead, but probably I call that Eubalina, E-U-B-A-L-A-E-N-A. -E -E Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got one last question for you, and then I know um, you may have to sign off but um, we wanted to know, would the length of the root give any indication to the age of the animal when it died? So I think referring to this uh, whale rib here. The length of the rib? Or the length of the root was what the member asked. Oh, of the tooth root, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you sure that's referring to the rib with the bite mark? So I think I just received a correction. I think the length of the root on the tooth um, for the teeth before. Okay. Um, ah, there we go. That's the uh, length of the root. <clears throat> no, um, it's kind of hard to age these guys. We don't really have a good way of doing so from isolated teeth unless we were to um, cut them open and look at them uh, uh, on a microscope slide. We might be able to count enamel ring, or sorry, uh, dentine rings maybe, or enamel rings um, in the crown. Um, we don't really know enough about these to age them. Um, and it's kind of difficult even with complete skulls. Uh, they might preserve other, other indicators of age. Uh, what we call like skeletal chronology elsewhere in the skeleton, maybe in the ribs, um, maybe in the ear bones, uh, but it's, it's uh, there's very, very little known on how to assess um, the age of these. Aside from just saying, oh, this is clearly a juvenile, this is probably a sub-adult or an old adult uh, based upon size, suture closure, and wear of the teeth. Um, and the, the tooth wear is going to be affected strongly by what it's eating. So some specimens of Basilosaurus from Egypt have really worn teeth, but it's also interpreted to be um, feeding on sharks, which have uh, little tiny enameloid scales all across their body and wear down teeth faster, like we see in offshore killer whales that um, prey on sharks, and therefore their teeth get worn down to the gum line uh, long before they die. So there's a lot of factors, and unfortunately, um, there's no good answer to that question, which means some uh, enterprising graduate student um, or many enterprising graduate students can uh, try some uh, theses in this area of research in the future. Well, thank you so much for that information and for all the expertise you provided for us tonight. Um, unfortunately, we do have to keep going, um, so we do, Bobby, since you have to sign off, thank you so much for your time with us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Take care, Bobby. Um, Bobby. See you guys. So next, we're going to go ahead and move on to some shark specimens, and then we'll return to some more questions. Um, so the first uh, specimens we have are some teeth by Lee. So Lee, go ahead and tell us about these. Okay. Um, I've got two large mags here. Um, the one on the left is an Aurora Lee Creek mine tooth. Uh, the one on the right was found in the bottom of the Cooper River. Um, the uh, color difference 
uh, probably as Bobby was talking about mineral mineralization process. Um, if Victor wants to address that, that would be fine. Um, I, I would also like to know, um, because I have heard that uh, the modern uh, taxonomy that's uh, going on now is to change this from Carcharocles megalodon to Otodus megalodon, and want to know uh, if Victor had any comment on this. Great. Well, we're going to give um, Victor a chance to type his responses since he's joining us via chat. So while he's doing that, we'll go ahead and have you tell us about um, your next specimen, and then we'll come back to these. I think Don said he was going to talk about these teeth who were submitted by Joel, who's another Aurora Friends member. Yeah, I don't know too much about them, but the, uh, I believe they're Squalicorax. And there are two different species, so maybe uh, that could be answered as well by Victor. They uh, all came out of the, the PCS, uh, excuse me, out of the uh, GMR Queens Mill Run in Greenville, North Carolina. That's about all I know about. Great, thanks. Uh, well, thank you. I think we've got um, a couple more so we can go through uh, some more while Victor's getting a chance to type. Um, Joel believes that this might be Otodus, Cretaceous age, out of Greens Mill Run as well. So Victor might have to let us know what he feels about that. Great. Well, we've got a response back to our megalodon teeth. Um, Victor says that the genus name of megalodon has changed numerous times, and there is a recent paper that decided it should be placed in Otodus, but Victor is more in favor of using the previous genus name, um, Carcharocles. Excuse my pronunciation. Um, so hopefully, uh, Lee, that answers uh, your questions about these, but there's still some controversy about where megalodon belongs. Uh, regarding the teeth that Joel thought might be um, a totus, Victor had looked at these, and he thinks they might be um, Scaponorhynchus, again, forgive my pronunciation, okay. um, which can you clarify, Victor? I believe that's um, a type of sand tiger shark. Oh, he uh, says that it's an extinct goblin shark, actually. So very neat specimen to have with us tonight. I'll convey that out to Joel. Thanks, Victor. Now, I think we do have, uh, oops. oh, he has one more comment. Um, he says specifically for the species name, it would be Scaponorhynchus texanus. Um, so even more specific to report back to Joel. Thank you. All right, thank you, Victor, for providing that information. And we appreciate everyone's patience um, with the chat. With so many presenters, it's sometimes hard to get everyone on audio and webcam at the same time. I think Victor is going to chime in with some more information, but let's go ahead and take a look at our next specimens, um, which are some invertebrates that were brought to us by Linda. All righty. All right, um, since I decided, uh, since we didn't want nothing but vertebrates in this, uh, <laughs> in this <laughs> webinar, <laughs> I figured that most vertebrate people like echinoderms. So I thought we'd bring some echinoderms into the mix. These, this slide and the next slide are all from the Rocky Point member of the PD formation, which makes them about 66 to 70 million years old. And these are all from the same quarry. And this outcrop, the same formation outcrop at this little sand pit where these were found, but it also outcropped at Rocky Point Quarry and at Castle Hain Quarry. Uh, one of the most unusual things about these, this is a Phymotaxis tumei. And both specimens are the same 
fossils. One of them has spines on it, one of them doesn't. Now, for a sea urchin to retain its spines when it's fossilized means that it had a really bad day because the spines on a sea urchin are attached by soft tissue. So as soon as the animal dies, that soft tissue decays and the spines all fall off. So if you ever find a sea urchin with the spine still on it, it died really, really, really recently. So for the specimen on the right, it kind of got buried alive, which is probably really sad for it, but really happy for me to find it in that condition. So those are actually the same fossil specimen. They're both Phymatex tumei. Just one has the spines on it and one doesn't. Came from the same pit. So that's what's unusual about those. Great, thank you, Linda. I'm going to go ahead and show your next specimen. So this is a Hardwinia mortonis, which is a very common sea urchin in the Cretaceous in that same formation, the PD formation, the, the uh, Rocky Point member of the PD formation. And once again, you've got a specimen on the left that has no spines, which is the way you normally find them. You have a specimen on the right that has the spine still attached to it, which once again means it had a really bad day. So what we're assuming happened is that there was a, a bad storm event, a hurricane, something that allowed these specimens to be unfortunately buried alive and thus preserved in a, in a very, very excellent manner. Uh, great. Thank you, Linda. We did have a question for you. Where did you say these were found again? They're from a sand pit in, in uh, Rocky Point. North Carolina, it's closed, no, no collectors can go in there anymore. But it does outcrop, this same formation does come out in Rocky Point Quarry and in Castle Hain Quarry. So you could- Gotcha, thank you. <laughs> um, so we had uh, another couple of questions that Linda, you might know the answer to, or George, you might as well. Um, someone asked, why is there a difference in the color of the megalodon teeth? So can someone explain why fossils might have different colors? The different mineralization uh, in the soil they were fossilized in. You might have more iron in one formation than the other, more phosphate. So it's going to change the colors. I concur. <laughs> well, thank you both uh, so much. Um, I think those are all the questions that we had for now. Um, so thank you, Linda, so much for sharing with us. Next, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some more teeth. We can't get enough of them. Um, and the first one up is provided by George. So George, tell us about this tooth. Well, I found the tooth in 2004 in the Lee Creek Phosphate Mine in Aurora. And I was fortunate the day I found it, uh, it was in the James City spore pile. And there was a group of individuals from the Smithsonian there. And I showed it to them and was asked to donate it. And I did. Uh, they actually said that it was a Nanipus species. They wasn't sure which one, that it was an upper molar. And then in 2011, um, it was re-identified, and uh, it's a complete tooth, about an inch long, and uh, I donated it to the Smithsonian, and I have had two casts made, one I have for my collection, and one I gave to the Aurora Fossil Museum. Horse teeth are very rare in Lee Creek, and uh, this is a three-toed horse which stood three to four foot tall. And it didn't have a hoof. It actually had three toes split into where the hoof is on the modern horse. And the coloration was incredible on this thing. And I believe yeah, and can you remind us of? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, can you remind us of the age of this specimen? Uh, it's Plasticine, uh, James City Formation. So it's, it's really not that old. It's probably a million years old. It's the oldest. But you have gotcha. A, Thank you. You have another photograph, I believe, with the label, with the name of it. 
Oh, unfortunately, I did not put that one into the PowerPoint, but we can um, get that and type it into the box so others can see it. Okay. Thank you. But it's uh, extremely rare. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. Horse teeth in a phosphate mine because uh, it was a water environment, so very few marine fossils were found uh, or have been found in the marine environment. So it's a quite a unique find then. Yes. And it's the first one from the Lee Creek mine. And I don't know of any other ones found in uh, North Carolina yet of this species. Great. Well, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. The next fossil uh, that we have is another one by Don. Go ahead and tell us about this specimen. Uh, well, this specimen, as well as my other fossils presented tonight, was found in uh, Lee Creek Mine. Uh, an interesting day. It was cold and rainy, much like tonight. And uh, we were finding shelter, and I looked on the ground and saw something blue, very small. I looked closer, and there were about seven pieces of this tooth laying on the ground. And there were footprints all around it. And so I managed to grab it and over time put it back together. I believe it's croc. I'm not 100% certain. I have, no, I have no other information about the species or what formation it was found in. Great, George, with your... I'm oh, sorry, what was that, Don? The paleo bond is a good thing. <laughs> How long did it take you to put it back together? Uh, how to go in multiple goes, because there were seven pieces. Four of them were the outer shell, and three of them were the inner cone. So I put the inner cone together first, two pieces at a time. And uh, it took a while, a few days. And wow. I, Don, it does look like a croc. I've never seen any coloration like that before. That's mm -hmm. typical of the Lee Creek mine on the croc teeth, though. I never get to find them there. I find them in Belgrade and out of streams, but not always dark. Yeah. Dark. Well, uh, also in the Lee Creek mine, most of them have a, a root beer color to them, also. But that's a typical size croc tooth from uh, Lee Creek. Um, what age would uh, either of you guess the tooth is without knowing the formation? Probably a Pliocene. Gotcha. And we had one audience question, uh, perhaps for someone else who might have found a broken specimen. What was the name of the adhesive that you used? It's called Paleo Bond, one word. Uh, you can look online, number of sources for it. It's like a super great, cream, but thicker. Thank you. Um, well, our next specimen, I believe, is another one uh, submitted by uh, Joel, but I hope that um, some other people might have a little bit of knowledge about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an encodus fang. Uh, encodus was like a saber-toothed fish, I believe Cretaceous in age, a uh, herring of the Cretaceous. Anyone want that? <laughs> no, it's uh, <laughs> uh, This one was found in Greens Mill Run. The middle picture seems to have a piece of the uh, in front of the jaw as well. I think these are called palantines. They're, they're like incisors on a, a mammal, front teeth. They were bigger. The side teeth usually, if you find them at all, are much smaller. Uh, I have found some of these myself up in uh, Monmouth County, New Jersey, in Big Brook and Ramonesi Brook up there. So these are quite nice specimens, quite large. Do you know about? what the fish used them for? Uh, eating, probably. <laughs> No, I, I really can't say. They're, they're like saber-toothed uh, cats. I, I really don't know. People are 
People need to study why they had such massive dentition. The modern fish that uh, have teeth like this use them to stab a fish when they swim into a school of fish and uh, impales them and holds them in place and they swim away from the school and then they're able to uh, shake them off and eat them. Interesting. Thank you, George. You're welcome. Um, well, we do have an audience question. I think this one is for you, George. Um, can you explain how the Smithsonian was able to determine which layer the horse tooth came out of since you found it in a spoil pile? Uh, well, it was 99% James City material. And uh, there was some matrix on it, and they analyzed the matrix and uh, concurred with uh, my identification of James City formation. And also by the age of the tooth based on all of the other three-toed horse teeth known, um, it matched the uh, time period. But it was in a large area of uh, James City material. It looked like it was about three of the scoops full, which is 72 cubic yards of material, spread out about two foot deep, and the tooth was just totally exposed on the surface of it. Interesting. Thank you. Um, well, I think we're to the time of the night. We're, we're down to our last Q&A, and I can see that we've um, maybe got a couple of people typing, so we'll give them a second to write some questions. We have our first friend from Diane. Um, she asked again, what was the name of the horse tooth? Did you find the name yet? I'll have to add that in. So uh, great point, George. Diane, we'll get right back to you and type that in the chat box. I don't have the label available right now. Sorry about that, George. That's all right. That was my fault for not including the picture. It'd be great if you could add that, though, Sadie. Thank you. Yes, of course. George, uh, while people are maybe typing their last questions, uh, give us a 30-second spiel about your amazing fossil room. Well, I was very fortunate. I built an addition onto my home here in North Carolina. I have a little over 15,000 fossils that I, 99% of what I have in here, I personally collected. I've donated another 5,000 fossils to schools, universities, colleges, and museums. I've had people from 13 different countries and 30 states come here to see my collection and study it so far. So give me a shout out, and I'd love to have you all come by and see my collection. Well, thank you, George. We really appreciate uh, you hosting us tonight. We did have uh, one question come in. Denise asked, is it possible to tell gender in teeth, like in Meg teeth? And uh, Victor, well, some people go ahead, George. Some people believe you can if the tooth is convex or conve uh, convex on one side, uh, it's a male. If it's uh, curved, it's a male. If it's convex, it's a female. Uh, but the only way you can tell is to, to have a modern shark. The fossil record is not that good on uh, identifying gender. Gotcha. Thank you. And Victor concurred for, with you, George. He said, um, some sharks you can determine gender, but with Megalodon, uh, you can't. And we had a couple of comments from our viewers. Uh, Sherry chimed in um, that if you want to learn more about George, we've got an article in our newsletter, and she put the link in the chat box. And then, George, you've also got a shout out from Tom Pizzatelli, who just wanted to say hello. Hey, Tom, how you doing, buddy? And he's a YouTube legend we saw it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a great video of George and his fossil room, a set of videos actually on YouTube. So uh, please take the time to check those out if you want to see some more. 
Um, well, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude for the evening. I first want to thank um, everyone for being a part of our presentation tonight. Thank you to Bobby and to Victor for providing expertise. Thank you to the special friends of the Aurora Fossil Museum. We really appreciate your time and the fossils that you shared with us. And we know some of you drove pretty far to be with us tonight, and we really appreciate that. Um, before we leave, just a few quick notes. Don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms. That includes Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for future information on fossil events. Um, this recording of the episode will be available on myfossil.org as well as our YouTube page. So if there's something you want to go back and see or share with friends or family, you can do that. And speaking of YouTube, we've got a new fossil video premiering this week created by our graduate student, Mackenzie Smith. This video is a pilot for a series that helps to aim, um, helps citizens explore paleontology throughout the United States. So be sure to check that out. And finally, um, please don't forget to take our short survey. Um, you can click the link right here in the presentation to access it. We really appreciate your time and feedback. Once again, I want to thank you all for attending and our presenters, uh, the special friends. We hope you all have a wonderful evening. Happy holidays, everyone, and good night. Bye. Thank you, and happy holidays.